Hello, I'm Sam Ingalls. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Sound on Sound magazine, and I'm here to answer your questions about your music. Obviously, I haven't actually heard your music, but detail. Question one. Is my mix ready for mastering? No. What? Are you sure? You haven't actually heard my mix? Yes, I'm sure. Because that's one of those questions that really means something else. If you ask, is my mix ready for mastering? What you're actually asking is, is this mix okay? And the reason you're asking that question is because deep down inside you know that it isn't and there's something wrong with it. You've done a thousand mix revisions, you've listened to it in the bath, you've listened to it in the kitchen, you've listened to it in the car, you've listened to it in a remote cave system in southern Yemen, and you can't rid yourself of that nagging feeling that there's something not quite right about this mix. And what you're hoping against hope is that a mastering engineer will be able to take your mix, hear what it is that's wrong with it that you can't identify, and sort it out. But most of the time mastering doesn't really work like that. If your mix was actually ready for mastering, you'd be asking a different question, something more along the lines of, do I actually need to get this mix mastered? So, no, your mix is not ready for mastering. Next question. Does my room have too much bass trapping? No. It's literally impossible to have too much bass trapping. One of the most important concepts in acoustics is something called the Schroeder frequency. And in most small rooms, the Schroeder frequency lies between 100 hertz and 200 hertz or so. And sound that's above the Schroeder frequency gets reflected around inside the room and we can absorb it using absorption or we can scatter it using diffusion and we can make it not a problem. But sound that's below the Schroeder frequency, actual true bass energy, behaves differently. What it does is it sets up standing waves within the room. And what that means is that it's effectively turning your room into a giant resonator like the body of a guitar or the shell of a drum. And there's no real upside to that. As long as that bass energy remains in the room, it's always problematic. So what we need to do is try and let it escape or absorb it. Now, letting it escape means not having any walls to your studio. So in most cases, you need to absorb it. That's what your bass trapping is supposed to do. But it's actually quite difficult to absorb frequencies as low as, say, 50 hertz. The wavelength of a 50 hertz sound is almost 7 meters. And if you were to use something like acoustic foam to try and absorb that, it would need to be nearly 2 meters thick to make any difference at all. So thankfully, there are more effective ways to absorb bass by taking up slightly less space, but it's still difficult. So if you've treated your room and you're still having problems at the low end, it's not that you've got too much bass trapping. Much more likely, you've got a lot of trapping and it's not trapping any bass. Question three. Does that sound like it's out of tune? Yes. I'm afraid this is another question where if you're asking the question then deep down inside you already know the answer. In the real world, tuning's always a bit of a compromise. Equal tempered instruments like guitars and keyboards are never quite perfectly in tune. They're just close enough that we don't notice most of the time. Sometimes people play out of tune on instruments that are in tune. Sometimes the fundamental frequency of a note can be in tune and the overtones can be sharp. And sometimes things that look in tune on tuners or in Melodyne really don't sound in tune. So, yeah, if you're concerned that it's out of tune, it probably is. The real question is, what are you going to do about it? Now, in many cases, the answer should probably be nothing. Sometimes a bit of tuning discrepancy actually helps a part to stand out from the mix. Sometimes it's just on the odd note and it doesn't really matter. What's unacceptable in pop might be fine in folk or blues. And sometimes there's no solution that isn't worse than the problem. The real pain point comes either when you decide you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and use tuning on a project that didn't previously need it, or worse still, when you've already tuned everything in the project, it still sounds out of tune. 
Now, if that's the case, you might find it's actually an arrangement issue and that dropping out a couple of parts or changing the inversion of some chords can help things sound better. Alternatively, you might even find that shifting a couple of notes slightly off the tuning grid helps to make things sound more in tune. But either way, if it sounds out of tune, it is out of tune. Sorry. Question five, how can I find a manager? Now, this is a question that's often asked by people who feel they have talent, but they're not quite getting anywhere. You're in a band, you're not getting any gigs. You're a producer, you don't have any contacts. You're a songwriter and no one's recording your songs. So you think, what I need is a manager. They'll have contacts at venues and record labels and publishing houses. They'll help get my music out there and make me money and start my career. Unfortunately, this is an example of what we call magical thinking. It presents the manager as this sort of fairy godmother figure who's going to swoop in and pluck you out of obscurity and fly off with you to the upper echelons of the music industry. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work like that. What managers actually do is help people who are already successful get more successful. They help bands who are already getting gigs to get better gigs. They help people who are already getting paid to get paid more and faster. And they help people who already have connections to get more connections. In other words, if you're in a band that no one goes to see, or you're a producer that no one wants to work with, or you're a songwriter who's only ever recording your own songs because nobody else will, then the only kind of manager who's going to want to work with you is someone who's in the same position. Real, good, actual, experienced managers are looking for potential that's a bit more concrete than that. They're looking for bands who are already selling out gigs in their hometown and want to go further afield. They're looking at artists who are already beginning to blow up on TikTok or YouTube. That's the kind of potential that real management are looking for. And that's when you actually need a manager. So the answer to the question, how can I find a manager, is to become successful enough that managers come and find you. Question six, why don't my mixes sound as loud as my references? Good question. So you're doing all the obvious stuff, right? You're compressing your mix, you're bouncing it out through a limiter, you're level matching it against your references, and still it doesn't have the same impact. It might measure the same, it might peak at the same level, but it's just not as loud. Why? The answer here is you're not pushing the mid-range hard enough. What do I mean by that? Human hearing is more sensitive to some frequencies than others, and it's most sensitive in the mid-range, between about 500 hertz and 5 kilohertz. So if too much of the energy in your mix is right down in the low bass or right up at the top, it might measure the same and peak at the same level, but subjectively it won't be as loud. So next time this happens, don't automatically try adding more compression or more limiting. Try this instead. Put an EQ on your mix bus. Create a broad parametric band, just boosting by 2 or 3 dB. Start it at maybe 2 kHz. Move it slowly up and down until you find the spot that sounds best. And I would put a small amount of money on that solving your problem. Now, of course, it might only solve that problem by introducing a few problems of its own because one of the things about boosting the mid-range is that it can make things sound harsh or gritty especially if you've got lots of saturation going on in the mix so you might need to go back and rethink some of the other things that you've done getting that mid-range to sound really full and present without also sounding thin or cardboardy or harsh or tinny is challenging and that's one of the hallmarks of a really great professional mix, which may be the reason why you didn't notice that your reference mixes pushed the mid-range harder than your mix. Last question. What's the most useful way I can spend £6.99? Easy. The new issue of Sound on Sound magazine is out now. And as ever, it's brimful of impartial reviews, insightful interviews and informative workshops. And I don't need to hear anyone's music to know that's a bit of a bargain. Thanks for watching.